Okay, um, well, thanks everyone for coming to the Tuna Stock Assessment Good Practices Workshop. Um, we're just going to start off with a welcome from Richard O'Driscoll, who's the Chief Scientist of uh, Niwa Fisheries. Uh, then I'm going to provide some housekeeping information, and then Mark's going to talk about uh, the Cap and Workshop series and, and other related stuff. So, um, pass over to Richard. If, Richard, if you could share your um, presentation, please. Thanks, Simon. Hopefully, uh, people can see that. Um, could I get a confirmation from somebody? Yep. Yep, perfect. So, Kira Koto, Hori Mai, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to New Zealand and the CAPAM Tuna Stock Assessment Good Practices Workshop. Uh, I'm the Chief Scientist in Fisheries at the New Zealand National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, or NIWA, one of the sponsors of this workshop, and I've been given the honour of welcoming you uh, here today. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be there in person. I'm trying to juggle two different meetings at once today, so I'm doing them both virtually. Um, we've got 81 participants, which who I believe are registered for this workshop from 27 different countries. Um, most are joining online, but it's certainly our privilege to host 26 of you here in Wellington. Aotearoa New Zealand has a long history of fishing. Uh, indeed, legend tells us that our land itself was fished from the sea by the Polynesian demigod Maui. And I want to open the workshop by sharing the original fishing story. So after a miraculous birth and upbringing, Maui won the affection of his supernatural parents, and probably because of that, he was despised by his four brothers. They conspired to leave him behind when they went out fishing, but he overheard their plans, and he secretly made a fish hook from a magical ancestral jawbone. The night before the fishing trip, he crept into his brother's canoe and hid under the floorboards. It wasn't until the brothers were far out of sight of land and had filled the bottom of the canoe with little fish that Maui revealed himself. Then he took out his magic fish hook and threw it over the side of the canoe, chanting powerful incantations as he did so. The hook went deeper and deeper into the sea until Maui felt the hook had touched something. He tugged back and far below the hook caught fast. It was a huge fish and together with his brothers, Maui brought the fish to the surface. To this day, uh, the North Island of New Zealand is known as the fish of Maui, Te Ika a Maui. And I'm trying to change my slide to show you that. And it's not working. There we go. Uh, so the, the North Island of New Zealand, which you see on the right is a Te Ika a Maui or Maui's fish. And you can see that the fish's head is in the south and its tail is to the north. The South Island is Maui's canoe and Stewart Island or Rakiura is the anchor stone of the canoe. Fishing is still important to New Zealand today and it's one of our top 10 export earners with fish sent around the world. Here at Niwa, our role is to provide information to inform the management of fisheries by the New Zealand government. We have over 700 staff at Niwa covering all aspects of marine, freshwater and atmospheric research and in any given year, about 160 of our staff will work on a fisheries project. We operate under a limited budget with much of the cost of our fisheries research cost recovered from the fishing industry through levies on their quota. As such, we're always being asked to do more for less and improvements to model approaches are a key aspect of this. Especially for a biologist like myself, stock assessment can be as much of an art as a science. As well as introducing new ideas and facilitating debate, events like this are a really useful way to catalyze change in the culture of how assessments are done. For example, there is a pressing need for better understanding of how to address spatial issues in assessment, which is only increased by the impacts of things like climate change. There's a really useful link here between this CAPM meeting and the spatial stock assessment meeting, which has just finished. So once again, welcome and I wish you all the very best for your discussions.
Okay, thanks very much, Richard. I'm just going to give some brief remarks and some general housekeeping information. So an update on when I sent the information to Richard about how many people were registered. I guess this is one of the issues without of not having a deadline and people not having to pay that they continue to register. So now we're up to 40 people. Well, last night we were up to 40 people registered in person and 99 registered to attend virtually. Um, yeah, so in terms of a need for this kind of meeting, um, there's, there's a lot of different cultures and ways of, of doing stock assessment uh, in, in different uh, tuna RFMOs. Um, so it's really useful to have discussions that kind of bring people together and people can decide what, uh, work out what the best way to go is. Um, one of the issues that I looked at is related to this. I looked at, um, as part of my talk on, on uh, long line size data, I looked at how people define effective sample sizes for size data. And everybody seems to have a different method. Um, like at IATDC, for their initial effective sample size numbers, they're using N over 100. ICAT, they've got log to base 10 of N in one assessment and log to base N over 10 um, in another assessment. Uh, uh, SPC using the minimum of 1,000 at N and then dividing that by 25 or some other number. Um, uh, an ISC assessment using N over 100 and then rescaling all so that they have a maximum um, of 30 in, in their best fishery. And IOTC are applying five per quarter to all fisheries. So some of this is, is assessment dependent, um, but a lot of it is just the, you know, that we haven't discussed it with each other, we haven't worked out what the best approach is in general. Um, yeah, sponsors of this meeting, uh, NIWA has provided uh, a lot of funding and we also thank ISSF for providing um, funding for the meeting and also bringing some, uh, an attendee here from each of the two RFMOs, that was uh, really helpful. Um, we'd also like to thank NOAA Fisheries who supported the spatial workshop, which and by putting the two workshops together, um, it makes it much more efficient. Uh, for the evening events, we've got a series of recommended uh, craft beer places to go to. Um, for tonight, uh, suggesting a place for people to meet up is at the Heyday Bar in Cuba Street. Um, we're having a workshop dinner on Wednesday night. We've, uh, we've made a booking at Max Brew Bar uh, for 40 people. Um, Actually, if people could let them let me know if they're coming, send me an email. I'll send out an email shortly, uh, just so we can get an idea of numbers. We've booked for 40 people. If we have fewer than that, then we want to let them know ahead of time so that we're not um, uh, causing them any problems and, and getting charged uh, for not spending enough money. Um, Thursday night, the Falcon Brewer, and Friday night, um, actually, that's a mistake. I changed that garage project tap room is very small. For 40 people, so we're going to change that to the Waitoa Victoria Street. Um, some housekeeping information the toilets are at the back of the room through that door. Um, there are men's and women's toilets. Health and safety there are two emergency exits uh, one over here and one over here. Um, the assembly point, if there's an emergency, is in the laneway over on this side. And in the event of emergency, please listen to the uh, staff instructions, prefab all staff. If there's an earthquake, because this is Wellington, um, so you drop, cover and hold. Uh, if possible, stay away from the windows over here. And of course, please, if you're feeling unwell, don't come to the meeting, um, you can attend online. And we have masks and hand sanitizer available over here on this table. Uh, there are also um, name tags for people who had registered up to Friday are available over here if you, if you want a name tag. Uh, so some, if, for people who are on the Zoom, um, if you have any technical questions, uh, please use the chat to ask those um, and put technical before the question. Uh, for presenters, could you please leave, uh, make sure you leave five or ten minutes for questions. Um, this meeting is very discussion focused, so we don't want to just have quick, uh, long talks and then no time for discussion. Um, if you're presenting online, please stop sharing and mute yourself when you've finished presenting and answering questions. Um, if you're presenting in person, please uh, provide a, we've got a, a little hard drive up here that you can 
use to transfer the presentation onto this laptop here. Um, the other option is you can uh, present from your own laptop via Zoom, but it's probably easier just to put it on here and then put it onto the laptop. Uh, and also please provide, everyone please provide your presentation so that we can post them online. Uh, again, for people online, it's the usual uh, Zoom controls. Um, and if you're called on to speak, just unmute. Uh, presenters controls, I don't think I need to go into that. Everybody's fairly familiar with these things. Um, a warning, presentations and discussions will be recorded. That's what this team over here is doing. Um, and they'll be recorded and posted online later. Um, and of course, the key concept of these workshops is discussion. So that's that's the real focus. We're going to record all that and, and post it online and um, lots of positive open discussion, hopefully. And thanks. And now I'll pass it over to Mark, who's going to talk about um, more about CAPM in general. Okay. Yeah, so um, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to the uh, CAPM workshop on uh, tuna stock assessment good practices. And uh, thanks a lot for Simon and uh, the rest of the team for all the good work they did in, in organizing it. Um, so um, I just want to go through a little bit of history about CAPM uh, to put things in context um, in terms of uh, good practices and the work we've been doing on that. Um, so it's, it's been about 20 years that we started these um, stock assessment workshops and they started um, first off as a um, stock assessment series at the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission um, and that was in 2002 on um, looking at diagnostics for the um, large integrated stock assessment models we use for tuna and um, I uh, put that on with Shelton Harley, who, who's uh, another Kiwi who's uh, here uh, in Wellington. And um, we only had 10 participants at that workshop. Um, the interesting thing here that there's still a couple of us around, so I'm still here, I've been organizing this for the, the 20 years, but John Hampton's online and here. Um, Paul Crone uh, uh, was at that workshop and he was one of the other um, founders of uh, CAPM. And we've also got a couple other people like Shelton is still around in fisheries and Michelle Dreyfus is still involved in the uh, IATTC work in the Eastern Pacific. Um, so we still got a few of the people left from the start. Um, and these are the topics we did in the um, IATTC series and pretty much covering all the topics of um, stock assessment. Um, and as you can see, the number of participants uh, slowly grew over time there. Um, in 2012, we wanted to try and uh, make it a, a more inclusive um, workshop series and bring in some uh, more people for getting uh, different ideas. And so that's when uh, Paul Crone from NIMS, Bryce Simmons from uh, SIO uh, in um, La Jolla and myself um, put together CAPM. Uh, we got some funding from NIMS, which started off and um, we were able to employ um, Von, uh, Juan Valero um, as a postdoc and um, a couple of other students helped out as well, um, Lynn Wardhouse. And then um, for the next 10 years, we um, did a whole series of workshops covering all the different uh, topics in stock assessment, um, basically ending up with a workshop last year in Rome that covered sort of a summary of all the different topics uh, and good practices. Um, for most of those, we also produced a special issue um, from a lot of papers from the, uh, those workshops. Um, and as you can see there, the number of participants uh, was quite a bit higher than in the uh, IATTC workshops. And then we moved to the virtual workshop series when uh, COVID came around. Um, so putting this in context of uh, stock assessments, 
Um, this here is my sort of ideal version of a, uh, a stock assessment process um, where you basically uh, come up with a whole lot of stock assessments, do some diagnostics and put them in an ensemble model for your management advice. And so what we're looking at with the good practices is uh, this part of it here, which is basically coming up with default assumptions that are going to go into your model. Um, but we've also covered this component here, which is um, diagnostics and, and um, basically improving and modifying your models and also the model weighting part. So we're covering um, basically the whole system uh, within the um, CAP and workshop series. So um, just want to now put this in context in terms of um, managing our tuna stocks. I'm going to focus on the Eastern Pacific Ocean uh, since that's what I've been involved with for the last 20 years. And this here is just a table of the results from the stock assessments and also the management um, that came out from that. And so this is the F multiplier, which is basically the amount of fishing mortality you would have to um, or how much you'd have to change the fishing mortality to get the MSY. And I've got a line there for yellowfin and big eye, and I've highlighted a few there where there was major changes in the um, management advice. And so most of those were changes in the model structure. So the first one here was changing just the start year. Um, and that's because um, the years you average recruitment over to get your uh, virgin recruitment, or average recruitment for reference points changes. So that changes the, the management advice. Here we've got changes in uh, yellowfin where uh, we changed the growth and the method to standardize the catch per unit effort. Um, here we had an external review of Big Eye, which is happening quite a lot in uh, tuna assessments now. Um, and so there was a lot of changes that occurred in that particular um, benchmark assessment. This one here is, is a bit different from the others because all we really did here was an update assessment. So we just added some long line CPOE but the results were highly sensitive for yellowfin, uh, for big eye tuna to um, just that, that new data. And so we actually ended up rejecting the whole assessment in that year um, and didn't use it for management advice because of that. We didn't expect something like that to happen. And then the final one there was actually dropping our long line index from the yellowfin tuna assessment. Um, so as you can see, the assumptions that you make can actually make a huge difference in the, the management. So we really should be focusing on getting those as assumptions the best we can and that's what the whole concept of CAPM and, and this workshop is. Um, putting that into context a bit more, um, looking at the Big Eye Tuna um, stock assessment and this is from our risk analysis and so you can see here it's the gain, it's the same um, F multiplier ratio there and what we've got is three different um, types of assessments. We've got a short term one, we have a medium term one and we have one that includes a environmental re regime shift and you can see here depending on which of those groups of models you choose you get a completely different management advice but even within those groups there's a whole lot of different models with different assumptions and that like for the short term models you can see here that can be from one to two times the f multiplier so that's a huge range based on ass uh, assumptions so again we need to really get these assumptions as good as we can to reduce that uncertainty so that managers can um, make decisions and here's the same thing, but in the Kobe plot context, so you can see there the wide range. Um, this one here shows uh, some of the steepness assumptions, which again is one of the uh, big um, uncertainties in our assessments, but also can change those reference points and, and the status determination. Um, interestingly, there's been several uh, reviews recently um, in the different RFMOs. Um, and those reviews have highlighted uh, a lot of uncertainties, maybe deficiencies in the assessments. And then if you look through the re reviews to see what those are, basically it covers every single assumption that you can think of in your stock assessment. So again, we really need to re-evaluate uh, these and try and come up with the, the best assumptions we can. Um, it's, you know, tunas is, it's, in, I mean, putting this in context of all, all the fisheries, tunas actually make up quite a lot of the total catch. So what we're doing is, is very important. And this, it's 9%, it seems like a low number, but this is 9% of every single catch. So it's freshwater species, it's shellfish, it's all of that, not aquaculture, just catch fisheries. But still, it's a, it's a large proportion. 
Um, and then if you look at the, the largest fisheries, skipjack is number three and yellowfin is number seven. So we we're up there at the top of, of those fisheries. Interesting to see Alaskan pollock up there as well, and Jimena Nelly's uh, one of the speakers here as well. So um, a big coverage of the, the main fisheries that actually are important. Um, one thing, this is, yeah, this is a funding push because as you all know, I've been trying to push for funding for a long time for Kappam and I'm giving a even more push now. Um, we often don't get funding for stock assessments, particularly for the large integrated ones, because it's seen as um, something that the wealthy countries do. So I just wanted to put that in context here, where this is the catch by uh, country in terms of uh, very highly developed versus the other countries. And you can see here that most of the catch is actually not from those highly wealthy countries. It's actually from um, other countries. And so it's actually important for those countries as well. And then another push here, this just came out yesterday. So the UN um, reached an agreement to close down 30% of the protected areas. So there's gonna be a whole lot of questions that come in here because this is gonna affect tunas in a big way. I mean, particularly in the Eastern Pacific, you know, most of our tunas are coming from the high seas. So basically, how are they gonna design these areas? What impact are they gonna have on the fish stocks? And basically, how are we gonna manage now that we're gonna have huge uh, protected areas? So the spatial modeling workshop was very important because we're going to have to go to spatial models. So um, just wanted to put that in context as well and hopefully again get some funding to do some of this. Um, and finally, to reiterate what um, Simon said, as you all know, CAPM workshops are all about discussion. A lot of things we try to do, the focus questions, the long um, time for questions at the end of presentations, the discussion periods, it's all about discussion. So you know, don't, don't feel sort of afraid to answer any questions or bring up any points. The whole thing here is to, to get those out and to have discussions. And that's the way that we can uh, go forward and, and come up with better assumptions in our models. Um, just want to note that there's a couple of pre-recorded presentations on the website. Um, we didn't have a lot of time um, for this meeting. So the contributed ones are, are going to be there. And there's a couple of good ones. Uh, one on uh, fleet structured assessment models, um, which is a big component of, of our um, tuna assessments with areas as fleets. And then also talking about size structured models, which actually came up in the, the uh, spatial workshop as a, one way to solve some of the issues with changes in growth among areas. And so that's all I have. Um, before we get on to the actual program itself, um, I just want to ask if there's any housekeeping questions or anything that people uh, um, need to know in terms of the organization of the meeting, just to get things rolling before we before start. No? Okay. So um, we're going to move on to the agenda and um, we're going to cover most of the topics in the um, uh, that you can use for stock assessments. Uh, a couple of them we're going to, like uh, data weighting and process variation is going to come up within some of those other topics. We don't have an explicit topic for those. The order's a little bit strange, but unfortunately we had to try and accommodate um, some people um, overseas because of the virtual nature of the, the presentation, but hopefully that's okay. Um, and we're going to start off with, actually I don't have any frequency, or CPU. Okay, sorry. We're going to start off. I don't have the agenda in front of me. We're going to start off with um, length frequency data, and uh, Simon is going to be our first presenter. Yeah, I guess as co organizer, I get to hog the podium a bit. Um, so, this is about um, good practices for size, for long line size data, uh, which is a really important component of the tuna stock assessments. Oh, there it is. Okay, and, and thanks to my co-authors, Tom Peatman and, and Sato San, who's here. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about, um, First of all, I'll talk about how size data, how we use size data in the assessments and, and what parameters they tend to influence. Um, and then 
what factors actually affect the fish sizes observed in longline fishery data. We make certain assumptions about how the processes of, of size observations are driven in the stock, but those processes that we assume may not be the ones that actually occur in real life. So um, with that in mind, I'm going to talk about more about what factors act are actually driving um, fish sizes that we see in the long line fishery data. Um, and given these effects, uh, I'll talk about how size data should be prepared, some suggestions about that, and then how should they be used in the assessments. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's not just entirely text in this talk, um, but starting off with text. Um, so they're influential for estimating things like growth with cohorts moving through the model, um, obviously influ influential for estimating selectivity. Um, in uh, multi-region assessments, long line size data, size data can often be influential for estimating movement rates. Um, they're particularly influential for estimating total mortality um, and that's something I'll go into more shortly. Um, and also recruitment, as we see strong uh, cohorts of size data coming through the, through the model, um, they can be influential on recruitment estimates. So size data has a big impact. Um, it's influential on many different parts of the assessment. Um, now, how much, how much impact do those size data have on, on the things that we really care about in the assessments, which are the stock status? Um, uh, and one of those issues is, is on effects on population scaling. Um, so through the total mortality estimation, um, and what I've done here is I've taken some uh, likelihood profile plots based on profiling the total biomass or the R0 parameter. Um, so this is all about population scaling. And what you can see in these from multiple different assessments is that um, the size data, so in these two plots on the right, and I should say that I've picked these assessments not because they're bad examples or anything, but just because they have really good plots and you can see it quite clearly. Um, so really useful assessments because they present these diagnostics clearly. Um, so in terms of the length data here on the right hand side, you can see that um, the, uh, this blue line is, is a steep one. It has a lot of impact, suggesting that the population scale is larger. Um, there's also weight data, and that weight data, the way it's fitted in the model, is suggesting that the population is smaller. Um, in the, this other assessment, we've got weight data here, uh, which is quite influential, uh, suggesting a, a lower limit on the population scale. And uh, the length data is also suggesting higher, it's suggesting a slightly higher um, population scale. In this um, ICAT assessment on the left, uh, the blue line is the length data. So that's clearly the most influential component of the model for population scale. Um, and in this uh, big eye assessment, uh, and you can see the likelihood numbers here are much larger. It goes up to 300 here, as opposed to sort of 60 here. Um, the length data component is also very influential on population scale. Um, so you can see that there are very important impact on population scaling, but also they're often in conflict with other data sets. Um, and there's also often conflict between the size data sets, as you see here, these in this top right assessment, the length data is saying it's larger, the weight data is saying it's smaller. And uh, over here on the right, we have another example where the profile is done on different components of the size data. So some of these size data components are saying the population is bigger. Some of them are saying the population is smaller. Um, and of course, one of the issues there is that you've got different components of the model saying that different things are true. And they're all going into the model. So we're kind of assuming that contradicting, contradictory things are true at the same time. And that doesn't make sense so really they technically they shouldn't be in the same model and what that represents is a kind of model misspecification and when you've got that kind of misspecification the appropriate thing is to resolve it and to say okay either this this information is true or that information is true if you assume they're both true at the same time 
then you're setting up data conflict. Other parameters, that tension is going to be resolved through uh, misestimating other parameters. So, yeah, that's, that's certainly an issue that needs to be uh, looked at a bit more carefully, I think. Um, just bringing in some context here, obviously, you're not just, when you're putting the size data into the model, the way you treat it depends on what kind of assessment you're doing. If you've got, like, the, I guess, the, the traditional or the, the old-fashioned way of doing assessments where um, you've got size data that are sampled and raised or modelled to represent the size of fish caught in the fishery, where you've got the traditional approach where you don't have an index fishery, then you're going to model things one way. Um, or you could be uh, using the index fishery approach where you've got size data associated with the index where they're raised or modeled to represent the sizes of the fish in the population. And you've also got size data associated with fisheries where they're raised or modeled to represent the size of the fish caught in the fishery. So that's just something to be, um, to be aware of for the rest of what I'm saying. Okay, so, so how does that work? How is it that size data affect the population scale uh, so strongly? I, I could have done this with equations, but um, then I would have had to um, find a lot more equations and put them on the screen and it would have been a bit messy. So I just did this in a really rough sort of way. Um, so you've got the mean size and the catch. That's a, a function of the mean size in the population and the selectivity. Then you've got and then the mean size, that mean size in the population is a function of the mean age in the population and the growth and the variance of length at age. Um, so this mean age in the population is a function of the natural mortality and the fishing mortality. And, and of course the recruitment to some degree as well. Um, and then this fishing mortality is a function of the abundance and the catch. So the way this, and what happens in, to affect population scaling is this mean size in the catch feeds through into this, in order to explain that mean size of the catch, the model tries to adjust everything else and what it ends up doing, since almost everything else is fixed, um, uh, to some extent, is it tries to adjust the abundance, um, especially when selectivity is, um, there's no variation in selectivity uh, through time, then that's when uh, the changes in the size through time can have a particular impact on the trend in the population. And that can get into conflict with, for example, the, uh, the CPUE. So the scaling directly affects both uh, biomass and F, and it's really important for uh, the assessment of stock status. So I'll just give you a couple of examples from, from my experience. Um, Going back quite a long way, this is one of the first tuna assessments I worked on, um, the South Pacific albacore assessment back in 2008. And we didn't actually have any CPUE data in the model. And when I first got to it, it was doing this. It was going, starting off quite low back in 1950, then coming up to a peak and then going down again, which seemed like quite a strange thing to see in, a, in an assessment. Um, and there was no CPUE index in the model, so the only thing providing the scaling information was the size data. Um, and so I kind of wondered whether that size data were providing reliable information. And when it had a look and found something that strongly suggested that there was a change in sampling practices in about uh, 1971. And so what I did then was to say, okay, what happens when either I change the fishery selectivity at that time or just remove those early size data? And when I removed the size data, the scale changed completely um, in the early period. And um, that early period jumped up to much higher level based on the depletion, I guess, that was happening, um, which made a lot more sense. Um, and in fact, when later we got CPUE data and we could add it to the model, that CPUE data showed very clearly that it certainly wasn't starting off low and then going high. It was doing something much more similar to what you see with that red line. Um, so that's an example of that, of the big impact that size data can have, um, which may not be, um, and, and it's just based on data problems. Um, a, a second example, um, 
was from a Pacific wide assessment with Big Eye growing much larger in the EPO than the WCPO, but the model has the same growth curve everywhere. And uh, if you don't have that queue, that fixed queue across all fisheries, fixed catchability everywhere, um, to keep the biomass, relative biomasses reasonable based on CPUE, um, then the model can estimate the scale separately in the two areas. And we tried to do that and we removed that fixed queue and we got really severe scaling problems with the EPO abundance multiplying basically by a thousand, um, which didn't make any sense. But that was the information that was coming from the size data. Um, but when we fixed them, the size data just wouldn't fit. So uh, yeah, and that's another example of those kinds of, kinds of issues. So what factors affect the mean size um, apart from the total mortality? And I'll just go into some of the issues there. One of them is fishing location because there's a lot of spatial variation in sizes. Another one is the season, uh, also sampling methods and set characteristics. And we often just focus, people often just focus on set characteristics, um, but that's probably the least influential. So the, these plots show some analyses of size data from uh, the Pacific, uh, like Pacific wide size data um, from the Atlantic and from the Indian Ocean. And here on the left, um, these are the different mean sizes of yellowfin tuna in different locations. And you can see this really large peak over here in the EPO, much larger, like 35 centimeters larger on average than you see over here in the West. And there's kind of a, and it, but even within the WCPO, there's a lot of variation in size spatially um, and within the EPO as well. Uh, there's a lot of variation and you can see why it's difficult to fit size data when you assume that the growth rate is the same everywhere, but maybe that's getting ahead. Um, in the Atlantic, again, we've got large spatial size variation uh, with um, in the Eastern Atlantic, you've got the largest fish and in the Indian Ocean, we see a lot, of, probably not to the same degree, but we also see larger yellowfin down in the south. There's also seasonal patterns with the size patterns changing by season. Uh, going north and south uh, between seasons. These are, yeah, these are quite large effects. Um, okay, I tried to look into the issue of uh, contact selectivity of, of how changes in the gear can affect selectivity. And I found this paper um, from 2012. Um, and they did some analyses of, of uh, Hawaiian longline tuna fishery size data, and they found large spatial effects, um, some seasonal effects, uh, interannual effects, um, and here between a seamount and, and the open ocean, quite big differences. But when they looked at different hook sizes, for example, there were almost no differences. Um, now, the problem here is that we don't have many analyses that look at the effects of different gear on the size of fish that you catch. So, I mean, the assumption often is that the hooks between floats will change the size of fish or big eye that you're catching because you're fishing deeper with larger HBF, you might catch larger big eye, but we don't really have much information. There haven't been many publications on this kind of thing. Okay, a second issue is possibly fish behavior. Uh, in the Indian Ocean, we see this big decline in sizes from 1950 to 1960. And after that, it's fairly stable. Um, there was uncertainty that maybe that's a sampling issue early on, but it looks as though it's not because that decline occurs later in locations where fishing started later. So it doesn't seem to be a sampling artifact. The decline is too rapid to be due to fishing down. And based on that, I'm mean, linked to that, the stock assessment can't, a stock constant selectivity assessment can't fit that decline. So there may be an issue there with um, changing fish behavior associated with fishing. Okay, another big issue I think is, is sampling and data collection methods. And that's a real issue in our stock assessments. Um, there's misreporting. There are some rounding issues. Uh, there's sorting that occurs before sampling happens. And there's low coverage and lack of representativeness and, and sampling methods varying through time. Um, so in terms of misreporting, um, that, is, that is a big issue. Um, Commercial vessels, longline vessels catching tuna like to report, they record weights for their own purposes. Um, 
And fisher, as a result, fishermen don't really like measuring the lengths of fish. Um, and so in some fleets, we've had fabricated data, um, which has resulted in, in and it, it's happened to a degree that we've got uh, real problems in, this, in the size data. Um, we also, as you know, due to this lack of a sufficient measurement, we've got low sample sizes in some fleets, especially recently. Um, so in general, weight data and observer data are, are more reliable. Um, yeah, I'll, this was some analyses of the Indian Ocean data. One thing here to note is that the, um, some of the data sets are quite consistent spatially. I standardized the data, taking into account location and, and year, and some of them are quite consistent, um, but others we have um, a lot of spatial variation, which doesn't seem to be consistent with what's happening in the other fleets, which suggests that there may be some misreporting going on. And similarly, um, the changes through time, some of them we see reasonably stable sizes through time, but other, others we see some large variation through time, suggesting that there's, there's changes in the reporting practices through time. And obviously when we get these changes in sizes through time, that's gonna have a big impact on the stock assessment because the model thinks that that's due to changing total mortality. I, I'm probably going to run out of time for the rounding issue. It's just that fishermen tend to, any kind of sampler tends to report at five and 10 centimeters. They'll measure, you know, they'll always just, some of them will, will, will report correctly. Others will just round to five or 10. So you always see these, these little peaks. And one thing that we noticed in the Japanese data that at a certain time they were, they were storing the data at two centimeter bins and they were rounding them down. And then they changed, uh, oh, they were rounding up and then they changed to rounding down and now they're rounding up again. And we're not sure when this change happened. So this is something that, um, uh, it's not gonna have a big impact because it's at a small scale, but this is just one of the, one of the issues that we have with, uh, with size data in, I guess, from all fisheries. Um, coverage and representativeness is another issue. Um, uh, early sampling, was from research uh, and training vessels and a mixture of research and training and vessels and commercial vessels. Sato is going to talk about this some more later, so I won't go into this too much. But the issue is that more recently there's a lot of contraction and so there's inconsistent spatial coverage. Uh, Restratification. Um, when sampling doesn't come from where the fishery is, you can get quite strange things in the data. So this is data that was from where the data, just where the data happened to be sampled without restratification. And these are the residuals you get out of a stock assessment when you fit those data without restratifying. When we restratify those data to deal with um, the location of the fishery, fishing, we actually restratified to match this to match the spatial distribution of the CPUE rather than the catch, but it really dealt with that um, change in the size data, removed a lot of lack of fit, and improved the fit to the size data. Um, data sources change through time in stock assessments. This is a so early on there was a lot of Japanese data. Um, up until about um, the 1980s, there wasn't really much size data from other fleets. And um, recently, with the sparseness of the Japanese data, we've started using data from other fleets in the Indian Ocean, um, which can cause problems when those size data have different uh, size patterns. So this is what some of the things we observe. Standardizing the Japanese size data, you can see this relatively stable pattern. And then these Indonesian data come in, in the same fishery and they're much larger. And that can have a big impact on the scaling of the stock assessment. Um, as I had before, there are various approaches to effective sample sizes. Um, yeah, so people do, using different methods, um, that's certainly an issue to discuss what's the best method for dealing with that. So now I'm just gonna go through some recommended good practices, given those issues, for dealing with size data. And the first one is, 
I mean, I, I cribbed some of this from uh, good practices for CPUE data because it's, they're the same sorts of issues. You really need to understand the data. You need to know the sources. You need to look at the data collection forms. Talk to the national scientists who understand the data and who know how it was collected and talk to the fishermen if possible. Explore the data, plot as you know every different issue you can think of and build models and try and understand what's happened with the sampling. Uh, ask questions about the spatiotemporal size patterns, look at sex differences, year effects on sizes and effects of data collection systems. Um, preparing the data, obviously you need to clean and remove errors and outliers. You need to model, raise and restratify to prepare the data. Um, have you got an index fishery approach or a more standard approach? Um, and for the fishery, you need to um, restratify to represent the size and structure of the catch. And um, if you've got an index fishery approach, you also need to restratify for the size structure, uh, for, this, for the, uh, to represent the population uh, size structure. Um, for effective sample sizes, given all of these issues we've just seen with the size data, I think um, we don't want to use high effective sample sizes on these size data because there's lots going on. Um, obviously, the usual things of, of having variable effective sample sizes through time based on how much data it was and how much you trust it. Um, there's a bit of ad hoc stuff there. You need to really think about whether the data in a particular time period are actually telling you anything useful. Um, avoid sharing selectivity across different longline fisheries. Um, obviously, you wouldn't do that with an areas as fleets approach, but it's also problematic in multi-region fisheries. I guess I'm, this is a bit beyond my remit going into selectivity now. Um, be cautious about our asymptotic selectivity, given that, you know, especially if you've got poorly understood size data, it's um, because it's so informative about model scale, uh, you want to be very careful. Um, avoid conflict between the size data sets. Uh, if you have contradictory information, it shouldn't be in the same model. Um, and there is some kind of model misspecification there which you need to resolve. Um, if you can't resolve it, then treat it as alternative hypotheses. Um, and of course, the Francis recommendation that you shouldn't allow the size data to prevent the abundance index from fitting. It's an unreliable source of population scaling information. Um, if possible, use time varying selectivity in your, uh, particularly on your fishery, um, yeah, well, obviously in your fisheries, um, to reduce the influence on population scaling. And if, um, if you, for some reason, you can't use time varying selectivity because of the, um, the amount of information or the way that's done within your particular assessment platform, um, then downweight the effective sample size a long way for, for periods that appear to have different selectivity. Um, so I guess other recommendations, given um, the lack of information about uh, what, uh, you know, lack of information about how sites data were collected in many cases and conflict between data sets, you should prioritize fit to the data set that you have the best information about and really downweight those other um, those other data sets. I think we also need more uh, and better joint modeling of size and CPUE data so we can generate size data inputs that are more representative of both catch and population. And this is partly a, a model development issue um, because I mean the vast models that are being used at the moment to generate those size data are can be difficult to use and it's difficult to include the important parameters in them as well. Um, and finally, I think there's a need for realistic simulation experiments to, to test these alternative methods and identify good practices given all, all of these uncertainties. So thanks. Time for questions. Does anyone have a question for Simon? Yeah, down the back. Hi. You mentioned um, starting off your effective samples as a pretty low value. So have you considered 
likelihoods used within the assessment that that self weight that estimated parameter to to get at that over dispersion uh yeah um i think uh the multi-fan assessment they've been uh working on the self yeah self-weighting likelihoods for the size data um probably best that i flick that to maybe nicola to talk about um i i, I mean there Yeah, I guess it it depends whether you think the model is capable of of providing a good estimate of the appropriate weight. There are multiple things that go into estimating that weight, um, and yeah, I guess I don't really know the answer. What's the best way to do that? Um, I think that's a, an area for research. Um, I guess there's a risk that a self-weighting likelihood may overweight data that are kind of self-consistent but not necessarily providing reliable information about um consistent with other things in the model like there may be other misspecification in the model which leads the size data to get too much weight but i'll, I'll... yeah thanks simon I don't, I don't have too much to add to that i guess i can bring up something that we've noticed applying the self-weighting likelihood in the spatial simulation uh, workshop which just wrapped up um that the the structure of the the composition the distribution uh, whether it was really sparse or or denser um even if the numerical values going into it were the same um you were getting much different expectedly much different uh, estimated effective sample sizes out of the back end, a smoother distribution. The model was estimating a lot higher uh, effective sample size for that um, than the, the sparse data, which it was essentially telling the model to ignore. Um, the other thing that if you're using, and this might be a little bit platform dependent, depending on how the self-scaling likelihood is implemented, but uh, usually you have to make a decision on how you group different fisheries for estimating those weighting factors. And so that there's probably a little bit of subjectivity in, in how groupings are decided depending on how many fisheries you have and the diversity of those fisheries in your assessment model. And so if that's, even if you're using a self-weighting approach that's probably something you have to look into that your a priori decision of those uh, groupings isn't influencing um, model outcomes. So that's all I'll add. Yeah, I guess I might add that if you've got a lot of size data that are consistent with one another, but you've also got a, they're coming from an area where the growth is different, the, the, the real world spatial variation and growth isn't accounted for in the model. And so the self weighting may give those data too much weight because, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, it's good to see data weighting coming up right at the start of the meeting. So <laughs> it's gonna be all through the meeting, I'm guessing. Um, okay, any other questions for Simon? Yeah, Dan. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks. Very comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, just you mentioned about the separation of um, the catch fishery and index fishery, and um, using and for the catch fishery filters through the uh, tie variance selectivity. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about it. I mean, it's a lot of it, when you're using time variance selectivity that's pretty much you presume that your size data is an accurate representation of your of your catch composition. And a lot of those variations, particularly for the tuna fisher, the size, a lot of variation of size data was coming from the sampling error, right? as you mentioned yourself. So I think in that case, probably it's not appropriate to apply um, time variance selectivity. I mean, I, I, obviously it's quite difficult to separate variability is causing from sampling errors and from 
um, from the you know the variation from selectivity itself. But I think that something needs to be pay attention to. Particularly, you know, we do for tuna fishery did do deal with a lot of you know catch sampling problems. And another thing is using the um, time variance selectivities that you kind of you lose a lot of uh, you potentially lose some of the population signals. And I know if you do that, if you have an index of fishery where you have, you know, you, de you de derive your catch composition for that, you, you, you have a ways to get, you know, abundant signals from there. But again, a lot of fishery that doesn't have an index um, associated with it, you only have catch composition data. But if there is true uh, abundant signals from there's if any trend there does provide any abundant signals and using time variance selectivity could you could lose that information so i think probably it's not to get to a general conclusion of using time variance selectivity for for, for the fisheries maybe you need to do a, on a case by case basis yeah i think that makes sense um i think in that case if you're then the second recommendation would be to only to choose size data from a period where the sampling was good and then completely downweight all of the other size data. And then you can use the good sampling to define selectivity and then don't change it. But don't put all of the size data in because then you'll set up conflict within that index, which will try and push the model around and, it, and it, it'll be a problem. Yeah, thanks, Simon. I think we'll move on to the next presentation. And so a lot of the presentations here, we're, we're following the approach we used in Rome, where we'll have a, a keynote and then a commenter after it. Um, and so the commenter on this one is Satoru san Uh, good day to you all. I'm Keisuke Sato from Japan, and I will present uh, okay, good practice for using long line size data in tuna stock assessment uh, related to the Japanese long line size read. And this presentation has uh, two items. And the first one is to uh, provide some information about the uh, nature of the Japanese uh, long line size data set. And the second one is an, an example of a problem in an assessment caused by the size data. Actually, it is a revisit and exploitation into Japanese long line size data in EPO presented at 7 sub. So this is a summarize of the uh, size composition data format to TRFMO from Japan, uh, especially for the yellowfin tuna and big eye tuna. And you can find uh, some differences about uh, spatial temporal resolution. For example, uh, in WCPFC, uh, year, quarter, and 10 by 10 degrees is a uh, uh, spatial temporal resolution. But uh, the, for the ICAT, year, month, and 5 by 5 degrees. And also, uh, there are special treatment for the size data for IATTC. We share the size composition data uh, by uh, MOU, and uh, it includes uh, year, month, and spatial resolution. This is the uh, original resolution for the, our Japanese size, long line size data base. One by one, five by five, ten by twenty. There is no any uh, compact, and also it includes a position and size unit, length or weight, and also vessel type. Vessel type means the commercial vessel and the training vessels, and also it is uh, it includes uh, sex information where available. So. The, this uh, data format for the IATTC and the MOU is, uh, uh, is the most precise one. And this, this differences of the data 
uh, format to submit, it depends on the uh, data submission rule for each RFMO. And uh, we have four data sources for the size composition data on board measurement by fishermen and by observer, by training vessels. And also, in, especially in the CTO, we have a port sampling program as a domestic port. And uh, we compiled in our institution in the database. And it includes uh, species, date, position, spatial resolution, and the size unit and vessel type, and also, of course, of the size itself. This is a historical changes of the number of size composition data in, in the Pacific Ocean by WCPO and ETO. You see the left two panels are for the big eye tuna and right two panels for the yellowfin tuna. And uh, uh, the yellowfin tuna has started around the 1950s, but uh, for the big eye tuna, uh, started from the 1965. But uh, in the uh, species database, uh, there are some in bigger tuna size composition data before 1965. This is the data, uh, historical changes of the data source of size composition data by the ocean. And uh, Proportion of weight and length data were defined by the area, TRFMO and the year. So we can find many uh, weight data from port sampling in the WCPO. Uh, and uh, we can find many, a uh, big proportion of the onboard measurement for, for fishermen in ETO. And according to the spread long line observer program, the size data have been measured by observer instead of a fisherman recently. This screen uh, indicates the uh, onboard observer. And this figure is a variability of spatial resolution uh, longitude by uh, latitude by longitude. 10 by 20, 5 by 10, and 5 by 5, and 1 by 1. For final scale, 1 by 1 spatial resolution is available after around 1985, around here, this uh, purple one. And the proportion, you can find the proportion of the fine spatial resolution are different by area and year. And this is a uh, historical changes of availability of measurement unit. Uh, one kilogram, one centimeter, two centimeter, and five centimeter. The final beam, this green one, is a one centimeter. The finest beam, one centimeter, are available after 2000, uh, around six. And some of the data are available in the EPO around 1985. So <coughs> this proportion is also different from by the uh, RFMO. And these two panels uh, provide uh, in information about the uh, training vessels. Training vessels is belonging to the local government and uh, they have, uh, uh, they trained the fishermen. Uh, and also uh, the spatial resolution, uh, the fine spatial data is available after 1965 for the training vessel. And one centimeter length data uh, are available after around the 1960s. Uh, sorry, 1990. This is the uh, sex information for the commercial vessels and the training vessels. This information availability is different by area uh, for commercial vessels. There are more, very small percent proportion for the WCPO, but you can find the large one. Uh, many 
science data hardware uh, such information for the commercial vessels. And it is available after around uh, 1990s for the training vessels like this. And uh, this is a comparison of the data point after 2000 for commercial vessels and the training vessels. You can find many gaps, uh, for example, around here. There are no uh, much science data around here, but uh, training vessels operated here and measured the fish there. Point. And also, there are no any science data from training vessels in the, most of the EPO and south, southern part. And you can find also the Indian Ocean, there are no any uh, science data from the training vessels. And this is uh, historical changes of a number of specimens by, uh, by vessel type, commercial vessels and the training vessel by EPO. So in the Atlantic Ocean, for example, there are no any size data from training vessel after 1985. And move to the second part. But I almost skipped the one. So you can uh, find this uh, presentation file at the IATTC website. And um, so this, is, this figure is uh, mm, so, uh, from the external review of IATTC Picatuna assessment in 2009. A prominent residual pattern in the size frequency of long line is found. And Japanese long, long line fishery seems to have suddenly begun to catch larger fish after 1990. Mm, and the size composition are very influential on parameter estimate and uh, any resulting management advice. So IATTC have uh, implemented new spatial definition and time varying selectivity but uh, the prominent register pattern was partially improved but uh, uh, it was not eliminated. So we developed the three hypotheses to explain the size composition shift. The first one is a change in Japanese long line fishing strategy, such as selection of fishing ground and or fishing season between the two periods, pre and post 1990. And the second hypothesis is uh, to the development of new fishing gear that affected the size of tuna caught around 90. And the third one is the changes in the size data collecting and reporting system uh, around 1990s. And I only focus on the, the third one. In preliminary analysis, a comparison between two that database, two size database of IATTC and Japan. And the two things were recognized. A vessel type, commercial or training, was not specified in the size data submitted. And also, until 2010, the raw data were converted to ranks before being submitted. So we can consider there are two components to be investigated, the vessel type and the unit of fish size. During the comparison, we can find uh, some differences, uh, then composition differences, uh, commercial and training vessels might be like this. And uh, there, this is a comparison of length frequency by unit of measurement weight and weight indicated the measured lengths were greater than the uh, lengths derived from combating weight data. And this is an important information. Uh, in response to a resolution by the CCSBT, since 1988, the Japanese long line vessels that catch southern bluefin tuna are required to measure the fish in lengths on board. So this measurement, uh, sorry, measure, uh, also affected the Japanese long line vessels that caught tropical tuna species. The proportion of land data increased after 1990 for both species and the equal that of the weight data in 1991. And since then, length data has dominated. 
So we conclude that for the, at the SAC 7 meeting, the evidences we presented indicated that the shift in size composition in 1919 for both species, yellowfin tuna and bigger tuna, is unlikely to be due to a real change in the size of fish coal. And the combined effects of the change in the data collecting system and the underestimation of fish size from the weight lens conversion probably lead to an artificial shift in size composition. So it is important to update Japanese size data with the information about the unit of fish size. And the informative size data should be used to improve the uh, previous redevelopment stock assessment. So, and also it is not directly influenced the regional shift. It is also important to specify the best type for better modeling of selectivity. And after this presentation, we Japan uh, provide information size data uh, with best type and unit of fish size. Uh, under the MOU to IAPTC. And this is a summary of this presentation, today's presentation. I believe the current IAPTC data sub submission format under MOU is better for the stock assessment. It includes uh, original spatial resolution, original means that is close to the, uh, our original database, Japanese database, and the original unit length and weight. There is no conversion, and by the same time, but uh, the data availability is different by each RFMO and the year. So, and the informative size conversion data uh, is available after a specific year like this. Uh, the data sources, some of the data source uh, information are not available before 1985, and final spatial scale one by one after 1950. 85 for commercial vessel. And uh, for the training vessel, it is available after 1966. And the final beam, length beam, one centimeter and sex information, the availability is different by area for commercial vessels, but for the training vessel, it is available after around 1990s. And also, I have some information. Uh, this year. So I tried to try to merge historical size composition data and logbook data in a set by set basis, but even if on board measurement, it is very difficult due to a lack of unique key representing uh, clues in the size data composition database. So but uh, we resume this trial uh, next year. So if we, it was done, uh, it will be done, uh, it can be uh, contribute more, uh, contribute to, to make a more informative size data, uh, hopefully set by set basis. And that's it. Yeah, Caroline. Thanks, Satu-san, for this great overview. And um, very nice to see all the work together in one, one presentation. I have a question related to the new length frequency data. I noticed if for the EPO at least is most, is uh, basically 100% coming from observers. And since the observer coverage is, is sort of low, like less than 5%, I was wondering why did you stop having the crew measuring the fish and if there are any plans to to resume that or or not? Oh, provided by the fisherman. Uh, so uh, it is hard to say, but the uh, uh, fisherman and fishing company compensate the cost of the observer. Uh, observer boarding. So they think the, uh, the measurement of the fish is the uh, work of the observer. Uh, so they 
don't want to measure uh, the fish size anymore. If, yes, so there is no any information from on board uh, size measurement uh, measured by fish Okay, any other questions? Yeah, Dan. It's just a quick follow up, follow up. I think with in Indian notion, we have the same kind of see the same things. We for the last 10 years, we don't have uh, size data from the fishermen from the Japanese fleets. It's all from observer data. So we kind of try to make some comparison to see if it's any changes and with that. Um, yeah, but take this opportunity. Also, just a question about because you look at a trend, you you look at some of the trend uh, size pattern in the in the EPO, right? One of your some of your slides, and you come to the conclusion of the, the pattern was due to um, more reflecting the change of uh, I think data collection and, and management. And we did out. I mean, IOTC we did a lot of uh, size data review work. At, I think um, Simon is leading that work and familiar with that as well. Um, we got this large decline of size data for the first early part of the fishery from around 1950 to 1960s. And it's clearly some kind of trend. I mean, it's kind of come to the conclusion it's not um, reflecting the, the population trend, but, but it's more to do probably with you know, data management and, and reporting kind of come to the same conclusion. Um, I just wonder if you have any comments but that because the trend we see over there is a bit different to the to the shift you see here it seems to all shift into the large fish but the trend we see oh. for the indian ocean the early years more of a declining trend which we can't be you know explained by the by the assessment then uh, yes, i actually i'm not familiar with the uh, indian ocean matter so but the uh, uh, decreasing trend of size data for the especially for the yellow fin is uh, also observed uh, in oh, as I already know. So we need to investigate the reason why the changes of the, the trend of the in state. I, I think we have a question online by John Hampton. Oh, I, I guess John can Yeah, hi. Unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks uh, Sato san. Nice presentation. Um, I just wanted to check with you um, in, in terms of the way that SBC has been using the Japanese size data in um, big iron yellowfin assessments. Um, so we, we, we specifically have asked you to provide us with uh, length data and weight data separately. So we don't get into this issue of having length data um, that have been converted from weight data. And I, I think that's been the practice now for um, quite a long period of time that we, we we don't have that sort of contamination of length data that has been sourced from weight data. So I think we're on a, a good footing there. Um, but generally in the recent assessments, uh, we have tended to prioritize using the weight frequency data um, which, as uh, you have indicated, results largely from um, port sampling and the WCPO, and so should be of, of good quality. And we've used that both for um, the size composition for the fisheries, and so we, we put that together in a way that's uh, going to be best representative of the catch, so we weight it by catch across the strata and putting it together for the assessment areas. We also use the weight data for the index fisheries, but um, putting it together with uh, weighted by CPUE, so it's going to be more indicative of the population distribution within the regions. So just, I guess my question is, do you think uh, based on your knowledge of, of the data that we're basically on the right track? We're not using um, the length composition data uh, much, if at all, at present. Um, either for training vessels or for for um, vessels in the fleet. Uh, can I confirm? Is it uh, related to the only for the WCPO? Yeah, for WCPO. Uh, 
actually, the decision to use the lens or weight data for the stock assessment in the WCPO is decided around the 2010 or the Okamoto san and uh, Sheraton may decide that. Uh, and uh, I have no concrete or specific idea the why they reason why they decided to use the mainly uh, weight data. But we can find some document in this WCDO scientific committee. Uh, sorry for my bad answer. Okay, thanks, Sarosan. I think we'll move on to the discussion session now, but um, feel free during that period to ask either Simon or Sato uh, any questions as well. So, does anyone want to start off with a, a discussion question? Yeah, Jimmy. Profiles in your conflict uh, that you were referring to. Um, the question I want to ask is how much conflict is enough? Because um, you say there shouldn't be conflict, um, but there's got to be a limit somewhere. You could wipe out a lot of assessments if you, if you want to get rid of any assessment with conflict in your likelihood profile. Yeah, well, that's obviously a difficult question to answer. Um, I guess you, one way to answer it is through simulation to explore that issue, something that hasn't really been done very much. Um, the first thing to do, I guess, is to try and remove that conflict when you see it. Um, it's often due to having non-time varying selectivities or having uh, a lot of size data from different periods, which is, for example, sampled from different locations. When the fishing moves around, you'll get changes in sizes which don't reflect changes in the population, they reflect changes in distribution of fishing. Um, so I think the first thing to do is to identify that you've got the problem and try and try and reduce it and then, yeah, there's no definitive answer of how much is enough, obviously. Uh, anyone else have a question? Yeah. Listen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the microphone's going, but when you first talk, it's a little bit quiet. So just talk into the microphone. It'll be okay. Uh, <coughs> yeah. <coughs> thank you for the thank you, uh, Simon San and Sato San, uh, for your presentation. I want to raise uh, uh, issues that the uh, long line size data is. Uh, in many cases, in many assessment, uh, it's a uh, uh, CPUE associated uh, fleet. And uh, <clears throat> when, yeah, uh, as Simon -san suggested, uh, uh, standardized uh, size data is one of the good idea uh, to estimate the selectivity of the CPUE uh, index. But in that case, uh, we cannot use uh, that uh, size data for removal uh, because uh, standardized size data is you know somewhat affected by the area or uh, yeah, temperature or something like that so uh, size data for the removal and the size data for the index is not compatible i think is there any idea uh, or can we use uh, uh, standardized size data for index and uh, also uh, size data weighted by the catch number for the removal simultaneously? Yeah, I guess in principle, I don't see any problem in standardizing the size data once for to use with the index. And then, uh, I guess, standardizing the size data um, with respect to the fish for the fishery, and then using it again. Um, it's, I mean, some 
there may be concern that you're using the size data twice, but then you just adjust the effective sample sizes of both and, and reduce them. Um, you're really increasing the information that's available in those data, the information with respect to the model by standardizing them. And so then uh, I think it's, it's definitely a more effective use of the data to use it twice in that way than, uh, you know, just to use it unmodeled. Yeah, any other comments or questions? So working, yeah. Um, I think Simon, you might have mentioned that um, about the weight composition data being better than the length composition data, and it was interesting when you showed the profiles from those two SPC assessments. When we had conflict, we had length and weight in the assessments, and we had conflict between those two. And the weight frequency data seemed to be better aligned with the other data, such as the CPUE and perhaps the tagging. And so I'm wondering if you had your choice. Would you prefer tuna to be measured in weight or length, or is it purely around the consistency of the programs that sample them? Yeah, I think it's the latter point. It's about the consistency and the reliability of the measurements. Um, we had an issue in the Indian Ocean with um, a lot of length data being unreliable because it because fishermen were required to produce a certain number of lengths, but they didn't like measuring fish. That wasn't what they did for their own purposes commercially. And so a lot of that um, length data wasn't genuine length data. Whereas fishermen are weighing fish for their commercial purposes. And so those data were more reliable. Um, and that's, I think that's a general, has been in the past, a general practice across tuna fleets that they prefer to weigh data. Um, obviously, when you've got observer data, they're being measured reliably in terms of length, so those length data are good quality. Um, so it's not, it's not about, I guess, the, whether it's weights or whether it's lengths, it's about the quality of the measurement and whether it's, it's real data or not. Um, yeah, and, and I guess, so I can't generalise from that to the WCPFC assessments. Yeah, another point is that if you've got weight, is it a processed weight or a whole weight and how it's um, expanded up to the whole weight and the uh, weight length relationship that uses is used to convert from weight to length. And if you get any of those wrong, which is what has happened in the past, then you get the biases. Yeah, Arnie, you have a comment? On the topic of uh, length comps and uh, weight comps, um, my question is whether the weight comps may be less uh, useful to, uh, I mean, at the heart, all our tuna assessment models in, in this room are age structured. So what we want from the size comps is to remove the right fish from the, the stock, that is to get the removals correctly uh, in terms of age. and if my understanding is correct, we would, yeah, the, the, the conversion from length to age is shorter than from weight to age. It might become quite muddled to convert, yeah, a weight uh, frequency distribution uh, through length and then to, to age. So in that sense, is are the length comps more accurate depiction of, of, uh, of, of the age composition of the removals? Yeah, I guess there, there is a hierarchy of issues there. Um, the first issue is representativeness, and which seems to be a much, a much bigger problem. Um, but the second issue is the conversion factor from weight to length. And there is some spatial and seasonal variability in fish condition. And so that will introduce some error into that, that conversion from weight to length and so on. Though. Of course, then there's also potential to estimate there are consistent patterns in condition. So if there may be uh, 
fleet specific and region and season specific conversion factors that can be used. And then you can apply those and convert your weights to lengths and then put those converted lengths into the model. Um, and then you're not, com otherwise the model will be using just one fixed length weight relationship and that's where your error will come in. So it might be better in that case to do the conversion first. Um, and then there's the point that Mark mentioned, which is uh, that sometimes fish are measured as uh, gilled and gutted. Sometimes they're measured with their tails off. Um, so then you get more error coming into those conversion factors and you really have to look out for those. Maybe, yeah, maybe just a quick uh, observation related to this is that in the assessments we see at SPC, the weight frequency distributions tend to be much uh, smoother than the length comps. So, uh, yeah, so this will have an effect on, on sort of what might be deemed an appropriate uh, sample size and things like that. Just an observation. Um, this is this is getting into a really technical detail, but. Um, we usually model the variation of length at age, right? And when we fit to our length frequency data, there's a lot of things that go into that, like the birth date, the, um, the, the, when you caught them during the quarter or whatever your time period is and things like that. Also, if you're doing it in weight, then you've got additional variation on top of that, the variation in the relationship. So there's even more. And so often you're actually using one, uh, variation of length at age in the model where there's probably about three or four different ones that should be in there. Um, and that's something that no one's really addressed in, in stock assessments. Uh, any other questions or comments, Carolina? So last year when we were doing the swordfish assessment, uh, Ijima-san uh, from Japan was helping us and we actually modeled the average weight so uh, catch in weight divided by catch number by set and uh, it turned out to be interesting for us but it turned out to be even more useful for the albacore assessment then he did a new analysis and was able to to even um, in by by area even find that there were two different type of fisheries going on one they were targeting more like a smaller average weight fish and, and another with larger average weight fish so i was wondering if anybody has uh, experience uh, on adding this kind of data to their assessments and um, if it's something we could do reliably ac across f uh, fleets or maybe even just for the japanese fleet or something yeah so just to clarify that's not actually using the measured weights of fish it's taking the total number of fish in weight and the total number of fish actually caught and working the average weight from that which might not be of uh, average weight may not be available for those fisheries any other way yeah yeah simon we did something similar to that in the indian ocean where we looked at one of the fleet's data and we modeled uh, weights divided by lengths from, from those, like the total weights divided by the total number of fish to estimate the average weight. And we found the kind of the expected patterns in those. And then we compared those to the lengths data from the same fleet. And we found that there was, they were really inconsistent. Um, that the, and we had suspicions about the reliability of those lengths data. And that result confirmed our suspicions that there were problems with the length sampling data. but. Yeah, that, that method of looking at data is, is a good one and it, and it seemed to give more um, consistent with expectations. Okay, yeah, hi Kun. Uh, just uh, one comment and one question for Sadosan. So my comment is that, uh, so for ITDC we because we need to standardize, uh, we, we use a uh, index survey approach, uh, survey fleet approach. So we need to standardize the lens combinations. And in, according to our experience, it is crucial to have high resolution lens combination data, which especially uh, a spatial resolution, if it can be matched with the CPU data, it is very important. Otherwise, 
if the lens combination it has five by five sample spatial resolution, we have to aggregate the very high resolution CPU data in order to match them together. So it is crucial to have high resolution uh, lens combination data for that purpose. And my question is related to the observed source of the lens combination data. So my question is, do you know, is there any difference in the spatial distribution of uh, lens data between the one from observers and the one from fishers. In other words, how like how the fleet assign tasks like uh, where where to put those observers and put the fishers to sample lens combinations. Is there a difference? Do you know? Is there a difference in the spatial distribution? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, I, I think uh, there is no uh, attempt for me to compare, compare the spatial distribution in the EPO or between the uh, long line observer and also other uh, commercial officials. But uh, uh, they say that they randomly uh, assign the observer on board vessel is randomly assigned the vessels uh, uh, operated in the EPO. So I hope, I, th I think there, there is no any uh, differences uh, between the two, uh, between the uh, vessel on board, observer on board and other vessels. Thank you. Thanks, Sara san. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah, Laura. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah. It's on. Oh, okay. Um, I've noted in Simon's presentation the recommendation by Chris Francis that we shouldn't prevent the size data from fitting the scaling index. And I'm wondering if we still feel comfortable with that recommendation. Um, yes, um, <laughs> the recommendation was that you shouldn't allow the size data to prevent the model from fitting the abundance trend from the CPUE data. And there are certainly problems with the with abundance trends from CPUE data, but I would say, I mean, the information about population scaling and trends in population scaling from size data in my experience are, are unreliable and so I'd, I'd certainly strongly support that recommendation that the information in CPUE data is much more reliable than the information in the size data. Not, not about scaling but about trends and scaling through time, not about absolute scaling because the CPUE doesn't have that information in it except with respect to the catch that's coming out I guess. But, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Dan. Yeah, maybe just a very practical question. I mean, in your presentation, you show how the different fleets the size data kind of varies a lot. So, I mean, obviously it's kind of an obvious solution in the, in the model is to, to trade them as different, different fisheries. But I think, yeah, one of the problem issue is that once you separate them, maybe those things should be discussed in the context of how you define fisheries, but I raise it anyway. But when you treat them as different fisheries, then you kind of data become more sparse, right? Um, when we're dealing with those size data, sometimes there's not enough data collected from different countries. And also you kind of potentially increase the number of um, size data in a model. So the weighting becomes a problem. I mean, in the context you're talking about preventing, preventing um, size data dominating from the model. That, that's also going to be an issue. So I just wonder whether it's, what's a kind of common practice of doing this kind of stuff. Because in IOTC assessment, we tend not to um, treat separating size data by country. There's different considerations. Sometimes, you know, too many fleets can increase the model complexity and that sort of thing. 
So I don't know what would be the best practice um, in these kind of cases. Yeah, I'd like to respond to that. I don't think there is a like a common practice about it, but I think it's an important issue. And I don't, I mean, if there's conflict, for example, if there's a lot of big size data right at the end that say come from the Indonesian fishery, which is what was one example I showed up there, those are either coming from a fishery with a different selectivity, so they should be in a different fishery, or they are coming from some uh, an area with larger fish um, or from um, there's some sampling problems and we don't really understand the, the, the way that data were collected properly they're being connected in a different way so I mean they're not providing any information about scaling so they shouldn't be in the same fishery definitely not but you can then either choose to put them in a different fishery um, and only have that small section of size data and it, then you're not really going to affect things very much or you just downweight them so much that they don't have any impact um, or effectively drop them from the assessment and then you avoid you avoid the problem and you're not really causing yourself any other problem by by dropping those data you're still gonna it's not going to affect the the numbers of fish extracted at size by by a large amount at all so it's I would say that's probably the best option, the easiest option and the best option. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question for Simon. So I think um, there are numerous ways to incorporate like time varying selectivity. So for example, um, I, I guess like we can use some non-parametric approach, like using some random walk and stuff where we can just uh, consider um, spatial like temporal availability like for example like spatial temporal availability can be age dependent and then uh, we just f use some fixed um, context selectivity and then uh, multiply them together to have the time varying selectivity and things like that and what kind of method would you recommend for you know like inc incorporating the kind of time varying selectivity or availability. I think I'm going to dodge that question and pass it to Mark, who's doing the presentation later in this on on selectivity. I, I haven't done a lot of work with time varying selectivity. And I'm going to dodge that question and say that we'll talk about it later. So, but re remind us later um, in the selectivity um, topic and we'll talk about that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I've got a question for Simon. So Simon, you, you recommend using an a index fishery approach, right? And so that means uh, also standardizing the length frequency by weighting it by CPUE spatially. Is that a reasonable approach when the length frequency differs spatially due to growth or something like that? Yeah, no, not really. <laughs> um, I guess I'm here to point out problems, not provide solutions. Um, so yeah, um, that spatially varying uh, sizes is, is a real problem because our models assume that growth is the same everywhere. And if we assume that that difference is due to growth, then I think that's probably a bigger topic than we can address in, in my answer. So I'm dodging that one as well. Okay, uh, Nicola here. Yeah. I guess a related question about the standardization of the the lengths and application to uh, the index fishery just based on uh, sato san's presentation and thinking in the context of the wcpo where it looks like most of the length data is coming from that research and training vessel fishery that has a much different operating footprint than the commercial well yeah, that might not be true because that was showing the lengths that you were getting from the 
commercial and that might not match up with their actual operating footprint. But assuming that that's representative of where they were fishing, you've got a situation where your lengths are coming from a different place than your fishery CPUE might be coming from. Um, and so in that case, it, yeah, you're gonna, you might run into some problems or have to make some pretty strong assumptions in your standardization model about how you're apportioning those lengths to areas where you, where you don't have samples. Is, are there any other thoughts on what you might do or just go cry at your computer? Yeah, so um, that's part of the reason for doing the, the spatial standardization, right, is to make sure that the, um, if you take the, the nominal samples, right, you're going to be overweighting the areas where they do the sampling. It, by doing the spatial weighting, at least you're overcoming that problem. And the spatial weighting by CPUE, um, rather than catch, then you're you know, looking at the population rather than the catch. So we're solving those problems. But I think what you're pointing out is there might be some missing data and you have to fill in the missing data. And yeah, there's, there's not much we can do with that. We, we use the spatial temporal models to try and fill in that spatial, that missing data. If it's missing at random, it works well. If it's missing systematically on the edges and big blocks, then it's a problem. So I think you're gonna be talking about that in terms of CPUE later on, and I think the same approaches probably can be used for CPU and link frequency. So, yeah, Simon. Yeah, and I guess in the WCPO, the Tom Peatman's work with reweighting data, when there's not enough data in a particular stratum, then that stratum is just dropped completely from the data set. So that um, that really avoids that problem. Okay. Um... Any other questions? Okay, I got another question for Simon. So, um, the the link frequency can differ spatially due to depletion. So there's just less big fish there because they weren't allowed to to grow to, to survive that long. It could be because of movement, so ontogenetic movement or some other size or age based movement, or it could be differences in growth and each of those will change how you do the modeling. And if you don't model it correct, you'll get biases. So which one do you think is happening in tuna stocks? Thanks for that. You knew I wanted to ask, answer that question. Um, I think maybe I should wait until. Um, I think it's probably due to varying growth, especially varying growth. Um, Certainly the growth curves that the IATDC use for both big eye and yellowfin are much bigger L infinities in the Eastern Pacific than in the Western Pacific. Um, and growth seems to be much faster in the Eastern Pacific. Um, so I guess the, the simplest explanation for all of the other patterns um, that we see, the big spatial patterns that we see, is that they're it's the same explanation everywhere, that it's growth variation everywhere. Um, I've standardized size data in the Pacific for different periods, um, from the 19, data from the 1950s up until the 2010s, and we see the same pattern throughout the whole time period. And I've looked at size data from different fleets, um, and we see the same size pattern everywhere. So I don't think it's due to depletion because depletion in those areas was different in different periods. Um, it could be, I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's a component of ontogenetic movement, but those are really big distances and consistent distances. So I think a lot of it, probably most of it is due to growth variation. And, and Carolina and I have been talking about this and work, trying to work on a, a publication to try and you know, look into these issues. And, and, um, but yeah, I think that is the key question. So a, a follow up question for Simon. <laughs> um, so is it discrete populations? Or is it some kind of um, just variation across space? And is it due to the environment? Is it due to genetics? 
Um, I don't know what the latest is on genetic variation across the Pacific, um, but I don't think there's much evidence for a lot of genetic variation. Um, growth differences on those scales, um, the, you couldn't have very much mixing for there to be those, I mean, it just depends, yeah, how much do fish move? Um, <coughs> because large growth differences like that, um, if there was a lot of movement, you wouldn't see them. So there, it also tells you something about um, movement rates. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I've got. Yeah, down the right. Is this on? Yeah. Um, just going back to Mark's earlier question on, I guess you started with the possibility of bias and I guess with the you know, recommendation to use or potentially explore time varying selectivity, if you're saying that it's mostly due to growth, are we running the risk of introducing bias by using time varying selectivity to proxy for things that are actually time varying growth? And I guess following on from that, you know, should we be taking more of a, I guess, rose approach to um, potentially avoiding biases by having um, multiple process error or you know, time varying um, processes in the model, which I guess it may be any combination of those or, you know, but essentially it, it gives us a spread of potential biases, um, which may then, which may then ultimately, you know, in, in terms of management advice, I guess, provide some, um, you know, some buffer against, um, against you picking any one, which may be the wrong process essentially, you know, by picking time varying selectivity over time varying growth, for example. Yeah, a, a good point. And um, we're going to be talking about model weighting later in the workshop as well. So maybe that can be brought up. But yeah, any any model that satisfies the, the data and the assumptions probably should be a good explanation of the of the the reality and included in the ensemble okay uh john hampton has a question online i think john do you want to ask the yeah. question or say, make your point yeah thanks uh thanks mark a question i guess to simon um you know i, I broadly agree with your um position about preferring to fit CPUE data over size data, where, where size frequency data, where they conflict. But I think as some participants have noted, um, there may still be useful information on population trends in the size data um, that are often hard to tease out when they're in that link frequency format. So I'm just wondering if there's, if there's a case uh, for, as you say, to downweight the size frequency data, but maybe to have a separate likelihood component for mean size, um, because I think it's really in the in the, the mean sizes, the trends that, that you can see in that over time that might be indicative of changes in the population and, and fit the mean size with higher weight. Um, do you, do you see that there might be a case for that or should it be considered? Uh, yeah, thanks, John. I, I do agree that that's certainly an option. Bearing in mind that a lot of the same issues apply about data representativeness and data quality and, and the locations that the samples come from. But um, yeah, I think that's, that's a could be informative as well. Okay, um, I don't see any questions. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that there's a, a presentation online about um, whether or not you should be using a size-based model rather than an age-based model by uh, Nicholas Fish. And that's relevant to this conversation. So I suggest you might want to look at that. And maybe if you have any questions about that, we can bring that up um, during maybe the spatial modeling section or any other sort of relevant section. Um, but if there's no other questions, I think we might want to break for coffee and we'll come back at 3.30.